Each of you, after returning home from work today, can switch on a game on your computer or console. And it's all due to one pioneering company. If it weren't for this company, you'd probably be playing sticks and stones in the street. Maybe you'd be watching soap operas, but you would probably never know what video games are. This video about a company that is largely forgotten now, but one that established the video game industry, Atari. In the annals of video game history, few names resonate as profoundly as Atari. Founded in 1972 by Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney, this trailblazing company not only pioneered the video game industry, but for a time, dominated it. From the launch of Pong, the world's first commercially successful arcade game, to the introduction of the iconic Atari 2600, Atari wasn't just a brand, it was a cultural phenomenon. However, beneath this veneer of success lay the seeds of its own downfall. The story of Atari is not just one of groundbreaking innovation and market dominance. It's also a tale of strategic missteps, internal strife, and a failure to adapt in a rapidly evolving industry. It's a narrative that serves as a potent reminder of how even the mightiest can falter. At its zenith in the late 1970s, Atari was the fastest growing company in the United States, its value skyrocketing to hundreds of millions. But just as quickly as it took off, this company was literally lightning fast into the abyss of obscurity. Atari was founded by two advanced guys, Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney. Their stories are what we'll start the video with. Nolan Bushnell's story, from his humble beginnings to founding Atari, is a testament to how a blend of innovation, entrepreneurship, and passion can shape a global industry. Born in 1943 in Clearfield, Utah, into a middle-class family, Bushnell's early life was marked by a curiosity for electronics and a knack for business. He attended Davis High School in nearby Kaysville, Utah, before enrolling Enrolling at Utah State University in 1961 to study engineering, later transferring to the University of Utah's College of Engineering, where he earned a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. During his college years, Bushnell's entrepreneurial spirit was already in motion. He worked at Lagoon Amusement Park, quickly becoming the manager of the games department. This experience was pivotal, exposing him to the inner workings of arcade games and the business of entertainment. His fascination with arcade electro-mechanical games, such as Chicago Coins Speedway and Midway Arcade, arcade games further fueled his interest in the gaming industry. Bushnell's business acumen was evident even in his college years. He started his own advertising company, Campus Company, which produced blotters for universities and sold advertising space. This venture, along with selling copies of the Encyclopedia Americana, showcased his knack for identifying and capitalizing on market opportunities. After graduating, Bushnell moved to California, initially aspiring to work for Disney. However, when this plan didn't materialize, he took a job as an electrical engineer with Ampex. There, he met Ted Dabney, with whom he shared common interests. This meeting was crucial, as the two would go on to form a partnership that laid the foundation for Atari. Inspired by his ideas of combining food service with electronic gaming, Bushnell shared his vision with Dabney, taking him to the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory to show him the game Space War, which would later influence their creation of legendary Pong. Ted Dabney's journey to co-founding Atari is marked by early challenges and a self-taught approach to electronics and computing. Born in San Francisco, California, to Irma and Samuel Frederick Dabney, his early life was disrupted by his parents' divorce, leading him to be raised by his father. Dabney attended several schools, including John A. O'Connell High School of Technology, where he studied trade drafting. This education led to a job with the California Department of Transportation while he was still a teenager. He eventually graduated from San Mateo High School, where a math teacher named Walker sparked his his interest in electronics and computing. After high school, Dabney took a summer job with a local surveying company. However, when this job ended, he enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. During his three years in the Corps, he took courses in electronics, further developing his interest in the field. Upon leaving the Marine Corps, he was admitted to San Francisco State University, but lacked the funds to support his education. Instead, Dabney took a job with Bank of America utilizing his electronics experience to maintain the electronic recording machine, accounting. Dabney's career trajectory eventually led him to cross paths with Nolan Bushnell. The duo's shared interests and complementary skills in electronics and business would lay the groundwork for the formation of Atari, marking the beginning of a new era in the video game industry.
In the early 1970s, a revolution quietly brewed in the heart of California. This was a revolution not of politics or social change, but of pixels and play. At its forefront were Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney, two visionaries who dared to dream of a world where video games would be a staple in every household. In 1972, this dream gave birth to Atari, a company that would become synonymous with the video game industry. The journey began with Pong, a simple yet addictive game simulating table tennis. Bushnell and Dabney, working in a small workshop, crafted this electronic marvel that would captivate the masses. Released in 1972, Pong was not just Atari's first product. It was the spark that ignited the video game industry. With its simplistic graphics and engaging gameplay, Pong became an instant hit, a beacon of the potential that video games held. By 1975, Atari had already made a name for itself, but it was the release of the Atari 2600 in 1977 that truly cemented its legacy. The 2600, with its wood grain finish and a slew of interchangeable game cartridges, revolutionized home entertainment. It wasn't just a gaming console, it was a cultural phenomenon. Families across America gathered around their televisions, joysticks in hand, exploring the myriad of worlds that Atari offered. From the adrenaline-fueled races of pole position to the alien battles of space invaders, the Atari 2600 brought the arcade experience home. The numbers spoke for themselves. By the end of the 1970s, Atari had become the fastest growing company in the United States. Its annual growth was meteoric, its revenue soaring into the hundreds of millions. In 1979 alone, Atari's net income reached $415 million, a testament to the public's insatiable appetite for its products. In the saga of Atari's rise and fall, certain key players and their decisions stand out, painting a picture of ambition, foresight, but ultimately a failure to adapt in an ever-evolving industry. At the heart of Atari's early success was Nolan Bushnell, a man whose vision and passion for electronic gaming brought the world Pong and the Atari 2600. Bushnell's approach was revolutionary, focusing on simple, addictive games that appealed to a broad audience. Under his leadership, Atari didn't just enter the market, it created a whole new entertainment genre. However, in 1976, the winds of change began to blow. Atari, in need of capital to sustain its rapid growth, was sold to Warner Communications for $28 million. This acquisition marked the end of Bushnell's tenure, as he left the company company in 1978. With his departure, Atari's pioneering spirit began to wane, signaling the start of a new, more corporate era under Ray Kassar, who took over as CEO. Kassar, coming from a textile background, was a stark contrast to Bushnell. He focused on maximizing profits and expanding Atari's reach. Under his watch, the company ventured into the personal computer market with the Atari 400 and 800 models, a move that saw modest success. Kassar's strategy also involved licensing popular arcade games for the Atari consoles, a tactic that initially paid off handsomely. However, Kassar's lack of understanding of the video game industry's nuances began to show. His decision to mass-produce games led to a dilution in quality, a mistake that would have dire consequences. The beginning of the decline can be traced back to a series of strategic missteps. Central to these was the failure to maintain the quality of its game library. The rush to capitalize on the booming market led to an oversaturation of subpar games. This decline in quality was exemplified by the infamous E.T. The Extraterrestrial Game, released in 1982. Hastily developed in just five and a half weeks to coincide with the Christmas season, the game was critically panned and commercially disastrous. It became emblematic of Atari's fall from grace, with millions of unsold cartridges ultimately buried in a New Mexico landfill. Internal conflicts further compounded these issues. The departure of Nolan Bushnell in 1978 had left a void in visionary leadership. Ray Kassar, his successor, brought a vastly different approach to managing the company. Kassar's background in textiles seemed an ill fit for the dynamic world of video gaming, and his leadership style clashed with the company's innovative culture. Under his watch, Atari's focus shifted from pioneering new gaming frontiers to a short-sighted emphasis on profits. The repercussions of these missteps were catastrophic. By 1983, the video game industry experienced a massive crash. Revenues plummeted industry-wide, with Atari suffering a staggering $536 million loss in the second quarter alone. The company that had once accounted for a third of Warner Communications' profits was now its albatross, dragging down the pair
parent company's financial performance. The Atari 5200, released in 1982 as a successor to the 2600, failed to replicate its predecessor's success. The Atari 5200 Super System and all the exciting new games now at a new low price. Super System. Plagued by a lack of backward compatibility with 2600 games and overshadowed by emerging competitors like the ColcaVision, the 5200 was a commercial disappointment. This failure underscored Atari's misreading of market trends and its inability to adapt to a rapidly evolving industry. In the span of a few years, Atari had transformed from an industry leader to a symbol of corporate misjudgment. The company's decline was not just a result of external market forces, but also a series of internal decisions that strayed from the innovative spirit that had defined Atari's early years. The beginning of the decline of Atari serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of losing sight of one's core values and strengths in the pursuit of profit. Central to Atari decline was the 1984 acquisition by Jack Tramiel, former CEO of Commodore. Tramiel, known for his aggressive business tactics, took over Atari's consumer electronics and home computer divisions in a deal valued at $240 million. This acquisition marked a significant shift in Atari's direction. Tramiel, focusing on cost-cutting and restructuring, laid off a significant portion of Atari's workforce. This move, while financially prudent, drained the company of much of its creative talent. Under Tramiel's leadership, Atari ventured into the home computer market with the Atari ST. Despite the ST's modest success in Europe, it failed to gain a significant foothold in the American market, dominated by rivals like Apple and IBM. The Atari ST, while technologically advanced, couldn't compete against the established user bases and software ecosystems of its competitors. The video game sector of Atari also floundered. The release of the Atari 7800, designed to revive Atari's fortune in the gaming market, was delayed until 1986 due to legal disputes with Warner Communications. This delay proved costly as it allowed competitors like Nintendo and Sega to solidify their positions in the market. When the 7800 finally launched, it was met with a lukewarm response, unable to recapture the magic of the Atari 2600 era. The final nail in the coffin came with the Jaguar console, released in 1993. Touted as the first 64-bit system, the Jaguar was Atari's attempt to reclaim its throne in the gaming world. However, hampered by a high price point, a lack of compelling software, and difficulty in programming for its hardware, the Jaguar struggled to compete against the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn. It sold only a fraction of the units its competitors did, and by 1996, production of the Jaguar ceased, marking the end of Atari's involvement in the console market. As the twilight of the 20th century approached, Atari, once the beacon of the video game industry, found itself navigating through its final tumultuous years. The landscape of the industry had transformed dramatically, and Atari, struggling to keep pace, witnessed its empire slowly disintegrate. The mid-1990s marked a period of rapid and chaotic changes in ownership for Atari. In 1996, a pivotal merger occurred. Atari merged with JTS Inc., a short-lived maker of hard disk drives, forming JTS Corp. This merger symbolized a stark departure from Atari's gaming roots, as the company largely became a holder for the Atari properties and a minor player in the broader technology market. Financial turmoil continued to plague the company. Despite a series of successful lawsuits that temporarily bolstered its coffers, Atari's failure to produce a competitive product in the gaming market left it without a sustainable revenue source. The series of successful lawsuits that Atari was involved in during the 1990s primarily revolved around patent infringement cases. During this period, Atari, though struggling in the video game market, owned a substantial portfolio of patents related to video gaming and computer technology. These patents became a valuable asset, especially as the video game industry experienced a resurgence in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Among the companies targeted in these lawsuits were major players in the video game industry, including Nintendo and Sega. Atari accused these companies of infringing on patents that Atari had held for technology used in video games and game consoles. In 1998, a significant yet ignominious transaction occurred. Atari's name and assets were sold to Hasbro Interactive for a mere $5 million, a fraction of the company's worth during its heyday. This sale was more than a business transaction. It was the end of an era. The Atari that had once revolutionized home entertainment was now just a brand under the vast umbrella of a toy and board game company. The 21st century saw Atari's brand change hands 
hands yet again. In 2001, French software publisher Infograms took over Hasbro Interactive, inheriting the Atari brand. Infograms, recognizing the historical value of the Atari name, rebranded itself as Atari SA. However, this was Atari in name only. The innovative spirit and groundbreaking creativity that had defined the original company were largely absent. Atari SA attempted to capitalize on the nostalgia associated with the Atari brand, releasing retro-themed products and republishing classic games. Despite these efforts, the company struggled to find a foothold in the new millennium's gaming landscape, overshadowed by more dominant players like Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo. The story of Atari's final years is not just one of business failures and financial struggles. It is a reflection of a company unable to adapt to a rapidly evolving industry. It is a tale of missed opportunities, a failure to foresee the future of gaming, and an inability to reinvent itself in the face of changing consumer tastes and technological advancements. Atari's journey from a pioneering force to a mere footnote in the gaming industry serves as a poignant reminder of the ephemeral nature of success in the tech world. Its rise and fall stand as a testament to the ever-changing tides of innovation and market dynamics, a story that resonates with both nostalgia and caution in the annals of technology history.